Sure, we all get that wrestling is a wild and risky sport, but one thing is clear, it's not life-ending. Still, there have been pretty rare instances where WWE wrestlers have ended up causing real-life casualties both in and out of the ring. It's not the usual scenario, but stick with us in this video as we discuss WWE wrestlers who have killed in real life. Getting right into it, you've probably heard of Jimmy Superfly Snooker, but what you might not know is his history with murder. Back in the day, Snooker was well known to fans when wrestling was still a serious business. This was a few years before it became sport entertainment. You know what's even cooler? Snooker inspired Mick Foley to become a wrestler. But as glamorous as Jimmy Snooker's life looked, behind the scenes were pretty dark. Snooker struggled with substance abuse, especially cocaine. He was also quite difficult to be around, probably because of his strength. So he started traveling with a woman named Nancy Argentino, whom he was reportedly dating. Fun fact, Snooker was actually married to another woman while he was dating Nancy. They met at a wrestling event and eventually started traveling together from city to city while Snooker was wrestling. But it wasn't all fun and traveling. Along the way, there were some rumors about domestic abuse. These concerns became much more valid in January of 1983 when there was an incident at a hotel where the two were staying. About four months later, in May 1983, Nancy Argentino died after an event in Allentown. Apparently, she hit her head, but a lot of people weren't buying it. Police investigated, but no charges were laid against Snooker. Here's where things got a little messy. Nancy's family filed a death lawsuit against Snooker and scored a settlement of $500,000. But Snooker never coughed up the cash, and the criminal case went cold. After this, Snooker went back to the wrestling ring. Thirty years later, the Morning Call newspaper dusted off the case and started digging. Documents emerged, and all fingers pointed to Snooker. Cue the grand jury, and Snooker was charged with third-degree murder and involuntary manslaughter. Snooker got arrested in 2015. He was declared unfit to stand trial. Competency issues, health problems, and a diagnosis of stomach cancer and dementia followed. But here's the thing. Prosecutors were able to present evidence of snooker wrestling in the same year he claimed health woes, suggesting maybe he might be faking it. The defense was able to counterclaim that snooker was a shell of a man. In June 2016, the judge ruled snooker unfit to stand trial. His attorney dropped the bomb that he had six months to live due to a terminal illness. All charges were dismissed. Snooker, the superfly, passed away in 2017. As for the WWE, they swiftly removed Snooker from the Hall of Fame section on their website, and his profile also vanished into thin air. This next wrestler might not have had evil intentions, but his moves didn't exactly earn him a good sportsmanship award. WWE Hall of Famer Scott Hall is one of the darkest figures in the business, not just because of his wrestling prowess, but his dark past. Scott Hall burst into the wrestling industry in May 1992 under the name Razor Ramon within the WWF. He soared to fame, winning the WWF Intercontinental Championship four times and carving his niche as the bad guy. But in May 1996, Hall said goodbye to the WWF and jumped ship to the rival WCW. There, he teamed up with wrestling heavyweights like Hulk Hogan and Kevin Nash to form the notorious New World Order faction. During his time in the WCW, Hall added an array of titles to his collection, including the WCW United States Heavyweight Championship twice, the WCW World Television Championship once, and a whopping seven WCW World Tag Team Championships. However, in February 2000, he bid farewell to WCW, only to return to WWF, renamed WWE, in 2002 for a brief stint. His wrestling journey didn't stop there. Hall grappled his way through various promotions like Extreme Championship Wrestling, New Japan Pro Wrestling, and Total Non-Stop Action Wrestling. In TNA, he even won the TNA World Tag Team Championship alongside Kevin Nash and Eric Young. But hold up. 
His bad guys wrestling escapades didn't culminate until June 2016, when he faced his final opponent in the ring. Despite not winning a world championship in a major promotion, Hall's wrestling legacy left a mark. However, Hall continuously battled alcoholism and substance abuse throughout his career and later life. Despite these, he earned a spot in the WGWE Hall of Fame in 2014 as a singles competitor and fittingly as a member of the iconic Amy Wu in 2020. Now, let's rewind to the days when Scott Hall was not just a wrestler, but a bartender at a joint with a pretty interstate name, The Original Dollhouse in Orlando, Florida. On January 15th, 1983, Hall got into an argument with a patron over a woman, and it was dramatic. The patron got angry and decided to unleash his fury on Hall's car. Amid the chaos, the patron brought out a gun. However, Hall was able to disarm the patron. The problem was how he did it. Scott Hall didn't only collect the gun from the patron, but he fired the gun and killed the man. Even though Hall didn't intend to kill the man, Hall found himself facing charges of second-degree murder for taking a life in the heat of the moment. Hall didn't go to jail, though. There wasn't enough evidence to convict him, and since it was in self-defense, he was able to live as a free man. Although, Scott didn't really consider himself free as he was continuously haunted by the fact that he took a life. A lot of people might not remember this next wrestler, but he was one of the most terrifying looking wrestlers in the business back in the day when he wrestled all over the USA. Ox Baker's finishing move didn't kill one, but two guys in the ring. His terrifying look wasn't even because of his wrestling prowess or anything like that. He was actually scary looking. For context, he had a shaved head, a mean mustache, and pretty questionable eyebrows. As if that wasn't enough, Ox Baker had a signature move that could make a grown man cry. The Hurt Punch. You can probably guess how deadly this move must have been. But before then, let's get a low down on the terrifying Ox Baker. In the early 1960s, Baker walks into Kansas City and gets paid 300 bucks for his first night of wrestling. And that was how the menace Ox Baker was born. Apart from looking like something out of a child's horror movie, Baker was actually pretty large. Standing at a whopping 6'5 and weighing 342 pounds, the ox name makes much sense. This dude wasn't your average friendly neighbor. In fact, he started off as a kind glasses-wearing guy, but fast forward a bit, and Baker isn't a good guy anymore. He's gone full-on villain, complete with a shaved head, a bushy black mustache and weird eyebrows, and his finishing move, the hurt punch. Even though Baker popularized the Hurt Punch, he wasn't actually the one who came up with the move. That honor belongs to Stan Stasiak, who called it the Heart Punch. After a little tiff with Stasiak, Baker renamed it the Hurt Punch. Catchy, right? In 1967, Ox joined the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, WWWF, as the friendly Arkansas Ox, but he didn't settle there for too long. He took his show on the road, wrestling across North America. Stampede Wrestling, American Wrestling Association. You name it, he probably threw a hurt punch there. In 1980, he had a brief stint in the WWF. Now, when it comes to victories, Baker has a pretty long list. He took down Cowboy Bob Ellis for the World Wrestling Association belt. Oh, and he didn't stop there. He won the WWC world title by beating Carlos Colon down in Puerto Rico. What about tag teams? He rocked those too. Ole Anderson, Skandor Akbar, and Big John Studox teamed up with them all to win championships in the NWA and NWF. But like most wrestling legends, Ox had his fair share of feuds. He had a pretty interesting rivalry with Randy Macho Man Savage. Late in the game, Baker also threw down with Rip Rogers in Central States Wrestling, but this is where things get pretty interesting and a little bit dark. On June 13, 1971, Ox and his partner, The Claw, were wrestling in an AWA Midwest Tag Team Championship Tag Team match against Alberto Torres and his partner, Cowboy Bob Ellis, in Verdigra, Nebraska. Torres was injured, and three days later, he was gone. Torres's death was no coincidence. Though evidence showed that Torres died of a ruptured appendix, 
Baker's heart punch seemed to have aggravated it. Torres collapsed during the match and died a couple of days later. This wasn't the only person who died by the heart punch, though. On August 1st, 1972, Baker lost to Ray Gunkel in Savannah, Georgia. Following the match, Gunkel died in the locker room. His death was caused by a blood clot, which broke off from a hematoma caused by Baker, which led to a heart attack. Surprisingly, these two deaths didn't end Baker's career. In fact, in 1989, Ox opened Ox Baker's wrestling school. He was a mentor in the ring, and he taught the likes of Mark Calloway, The Undertaker, and Brian Clark. But Ox wasn't done making waves. In 2004, Baker crashed the Ring of Honor and confronted Dusty Rhodes. Fast forward to 2007, CEW's Cage of Death 9 show. Ox showed up as the guest of cult fiction in an interview segment. Surprise, surprise, the man knew how to keep the crowd on its toes. 2013 rolled around, and Ox stepped back into the ring and won the CCW Championship in a 13-man battle royal. Up next, we have Vern Gang. This dude didn't kill anyone in the ring, but he sure used his wrestling skills to take a life. During the early wrestling territory days, Vern Gang was one of the biggest names in the industry. He was also the owner of the now-defunct American Wrestling Association, AOA. For over four decades, Vern Gagne was a legendary wrestler and promoter in Minnesota and was an instrumental figure in the expansion of sports entertainment in the early 1980s. Gagne rightfully took his place among many of sports entertainment's other big names when he was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2006. Growing up in Robbinsdale, Gagne was a three-sport athlete. While he also played baseball and football, wrestling was his jam. He won multiple state championships. He then went on to the University of Minnesota, where he continued to play football and wrestle. He even took a detour to join the Marines at the end of World War II because, well, why not? Although returned to finish his college career a few years later, when his amateur days were over, Vern had a resume that could make any wrestler green with envy. Four Big Ten wrestling championships, two NCAA wrestling championships, and the 1949 AAU Wrestling Championship, he practically had more championships than most people have socks. Oh, let's not forget his stint on the 1948 United States Olympic team. After a brief stint playing for the NFL's Green Bay Packers, Vern turned to professional wrestling at the urging of promoter Tony Stecker. In 1950, Vern made his debut in Minnesota. Vern was winning several regional championships left and right in the 1950s. In August of that year, he was awarded his first AWA championship when the first recognized champion, then NWA champion Pat O'Connor, chickened out of defending the title against him. Vern wasn't just a champion. He was an 11-time world champion in the wrestling world, holding the AWA World Heavyweight Championship 10 times and the IWA World Heavyweight Championship once. The IUA title was a big deal in Japan. This guy didn't just win titles. He collected them like they were trading cards. And speaking of records, Vern holds the title for the longest combined reign as a world champion in North America. Only Bruno Sammartino and Lou Thez have kept him company in that elite club. Gagne was able to go through his wrestling career unscathed, but that changed even after he retired. In 2009, Gagne got into a fight with his nursing home roommate, Helmut Gutmann. His body slammed the latter onto the floor, then broke his hip by pulling back on his body. Gutmann was admitted to the hospital and died the following month from complications of the injury. The death was officially ruled a homicide, but because of Gagne's dementia, he was not criminally charged. Gang dodged the law with dementia, but this next wrestler might just outwit them from the afterlife. Chris Benoit was a master of technical wrestling, and once upon a time, he was among the best in the wrestling industry. He could have easily been one of the top ten, or maybe even the top five, all-time greats in pro wrestling history. However, his career was marked by Bourne on May 21, 1967, in Canada. Christopher Michael Benoit's career lasted for about 22 years, spanning various promotions, including the World Wrestling Federation, World Wrestling Entertainment, World Championship Wrestling, 
ECW, NJPW, and Stampede Wrestling. Benoit wasn't just a skilled athlete. He was a bona fide top star, a future Hall of Famer, and a respected veteran. His skills earned him a place in the Stampede Wrestling Hall of Fame in 1995 and the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame in 2003. This made the sudden fall from grace with the shocking murder-suicide all the more. Looking at it now, there were a lot of peculiar stories and bizarre occurrences about him. Before Benoit disappeared, he was scheduled to wrestle on a WWE pay-per-view. However, before the match, he took his own life. While this was bad enough, what's more shocking was the fact that before committing suicide, he murdered his wife, Nancy, and their son, Daniel. Despite numerous conspiracy theories floating around, the main evidence points to Benoit being the one behind the tragic events. Over three days, Benoit had tragically killed his wife and son before eventually taking his own life. His wife was tied up, and Benoit's son was drugged with Xanax before being strangled. Benoit then hung himself on his lap pull-down machine. After the incident, WWE cancelled the scheduled live Raw show on June 25th and replaced it with a three-hour tribute to Benoit, showing his matches, segments from The Hard Knocks, the Chris Benoit Story DVD, and comments from wrestlers and announcers. Before the murder-suicide, Benoit had received illegal medications, including anabolic steroids and a breast cancer drug, not compliant with WWE's talent wellness program. The investigation into steroid abuse also revealed other wrestlers had also received steroids. After the tragedy, it was suggested that brain trauma might have influenced Benoit's actions. Tests on Benoit's brain showed severe damage, resembling that of an 85-year-old Alzheimer's patient. Advanced dementia, linked to repeated concussions, could be a contributor to Benoit's severe behavioral problems. This messed up his reputation so badly that the WWE doesn't even recognize him anymore, and his rep as an awesome wrestler is now mostly remembered for being a killer. Great Kali is regarded as one of the worst wrestlers in history, but that wasn't the only problem he had in pro wrestling. Kali was so tall, his size alone could make you question whether you were in the right weight class. Standing at 7 foot 1 and weighing about 347 pounds, Kali wasn't just a wrestler. He was a living, breathing skyscraper and made sure everyone knew it. Kali managed to carve out a unique niche for himself in the WWE. Being the first guy from India to strut into the WWE universe, he wasn't more than a wrestler. The guy was so large that nobody could ignore him, even if they tried. And let's be real, who would dare? He faced off against WWE legends like The Undertaker, Kane, Big Show, John Cena, and Shawn Michael emerged as a colossal force in a 20-man battle royal, winning the World Heavyweight Championship. The dude was literally living the dream. But wrestling wasn't the only thing Kali was into. Oh no, his larger-than-life persona spilled onto the big screen. From Bollywood to Hollywood, Kali's mug was everywhere. The Longest Yard, 2005, Get Smart, 2008, and MacGruber, 2010. He even went as far as Disney Channel's Pair of Kings. Kali eventually retired in November 2014 to return to India and train aspiring WWE superstars, but he returned at WWE Battleground 2017, helping WWE champion and fellow countryman Jinder Mahal escape the match. Kali himself pioneered the Punjabi prison. But let's take a little detour to a less glamorous chapter. Sure, accidents happen in wrestling. Accidents happen. Unfortunately, one such incident involved Kali and a move that led to unexpected tragedy. In 2001, Brian Ong met his unfortunate death after taking a flapjack from Kali 2001. Before the match, Ong had a previous concussion but the trainers gave him a lower evaluation for not avoiding injuries and told him to continue training. During the match with the giant, things took a wild and tragic turn. Even with his concussion, Ong entered the ring without protection or supervision. 
Ong died after receiving a flapjack wrestling move from Kali. As Kali inadvertently caused his death, Ong's family brought down a lawsuit against all pro wrestling, the folks responsible for the training circus. After less than a day of deliberations, APW was deemed recklessly responsible, and the Ong family walked away with damages of over $1.3 million. That's quite a hefty price tag, but for a life, it probably wasn't enough. Which of these cases do you find the most shocking? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section, and before you leave, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to Ring Rivals so you don't miss the next ones.